my wife, where's my wife at? Yeah, she left me. I... All right, she's hiding. Now, we're going to talk about marriage this morning. And I want you to know, men, as bad as it's going to sound to you, when you walk into the house last night after a sermon and your wife greets you with, now I have ammunition, <laughs> you know you're in deep trouble. But to show you the authority I am on the topic of marriage, on a scale of one to 10, Karen, one being not very good, and 10 being like the greatest husband who's ever lived. <laughs> what number on a scale of one to 10 would you give me? <laughs> two. two, no, wait, no, 10 is the highest, not one. Little shift there, you want to give me anything higher? Two and a half. <laughs> that, that is painful. Oh, yeah. All right. Rose, you're not at an Oregon game, calm down. All right, inside the bullet and on the inside, let me pick out a couple things because all of the things that I could talk about that I won't talk about are resources for you. Here they are, let me just highlight them and then, I'll, then you can go back to it. The teaching is on our website if you wanna go back and watch it. Two, every day this week, Monday through Friday, we have daily devotions. Most of you are on that, but if you're not, you need to sign up. But something new we're doing over the next 30 days is sending out a three-line insight about marriages that you have to sign up for. This tells you how to sign, it up, sign up for it. And every day around noon, you'll get a three-liner that just kind of reminds you of a secret to making your marriage the marriage you want it to be. There's pastor's conversations that you can go. Last night, Paul and I, one of the elders, just debriefed the teaching. There's four Christian books that I recommend. The, the, the one I love the most is The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller, but all four are good. And lastly, we went a step further and we created cards that are the size of a credit card. You can get them on the information booth and there's set six secrets that you can remind yourself of marriage. So the reason I did it this way is you can put it in your billfold. I have mine in my billfold. There's six, you can pull it out in your purse. They're easy to remember. Forgive quickly, be present, serve willingly, love unconditionally, communicate openly, show appreciation. Those are good ones to be reminded of. I am doing everything I can to help you experience and somewhere along the line I'm gonna to get to a three baby I am gonna to get to three all right so mom takes her six-year-old daughter to her first day of kindergarten drops her off goes back home that night her daughter tells her of a story she learned it was a story of Snow White and she goes mom I learned this great story of a beautiful princess who is put under an evil spell and a prince comes along and he kisses her and awakens her and mom, Snow White lived happily ever after. And the mom washing dishes says to her daughter, no, sweetheart, they got married. <laughs> I do a lot of weddings. And I always love weddings. I'll tell you this. This is kind of, I'm going to try to be as transparent. You're not going to hear from me for a week, I mean a year. So uh, I can take chances. I do weddings. And I always know that when that groom is looking at her, her, his bride, here's the truth. She's never going to look better than she does right there. She ain't. And he's never going to be more charming than he looks right there. Too loud, Rose. <laughs> Here's what happens from that, from that emotional high, which we discover scientifically that all of the emotions you felt on the day that you got married in that first week of marriage is within two years. Truth, all of them are gone. 
you're, you're left without all of that romance within two years. In fact, the wow becomes a ow in marriage, all right? Margaret Mead says the hardest institution for human beings to live in is marriage, and there's a lot of truth in that. A wife said to her husband, if I die, will you remarry? It's an awkward question for a man to be asked. Dangerous. Man thinks about it, and he says, well, if I'm still in good health, yeah, probably I will. And she says, well, well, will you let her live in my house? He thinks about it. He says, it's paid off. <laughs> yes. Will she drive my car? It's a new car. Yes. Is she going to use my golf clubs? And he looks at her and says, no, she's left-handed. <laughs> <laughs> I love that joke. There's more truth in that joke. Do you know the top three things you need witnesses for are? Number one, crimes. Number two, accidents. Number three, marriages. Need I say more? So we're going to look at this. We're going to go through this. We're going to study this. And trust me when I say, I didn't pull this out of psychology today. What you're going to learn, the four things that you're going to learn that can make your marriage better, come right out of the Word of God. And I guarantee one of them is going to offend somebody in this room. I don't know which one, but one of them will. But I will say to you, as we look at these verses, the same verses that we look at in the Bible that are true of the resurrection are true of marriage. So we're going to do that. But I want to take one minute, since I'm talking about marriage, and many of you aren't, to say several things to you. Most everything I say here is applicable to the relationships that you're in. I'm going to say to you that are not married, a widow, single, uh, divorced. Here's my piece of counsel for you today. Don't go looking and wanting to marry the right guy. Just don't marry the wrong guy. I'm going to say to you that are single, that this is a great opportunity, Paul tells us in the scriptures, for you to live a life untethered, uncomplicated, because you're single, for God's glory. There are things that you can do in this season rather than sit home and feel sorry for yourself. Paul would say you're in a great opportunity to do work for me that you could not do or wouldn't have the time to do if you were married. I would say to you that this is a great opportunity to become the person that you ought to become if you do get married and prepare for that now. So we're going to look at four keys, and in your notes on the back page, I've left four fill-ins. I don't normally do this, those of you know, but I, I thought some of you will need it, so let's, let's dive into this. Here are four truths, four foundations, four realities that I believe will make your marriage more than it is right now, no matter how great your marriage is. Number one, marriage is about our sanctifying the other person. Marriage is about sanctifying the other person. What, what is that word sanctifying? I'm going to show you the verse in a second. The word sanctification means this, that your responsibility in marriage is to help the person you're married to to become more holy. Your responsibility, another word for sanctification, is to set them apart and allow them to be set apart for God's glory. Another way to define sanctification is to become more whole. W-H-O-L-E. That your job 
in this marriage, your, your responsibility, your opportunity is to help this person who comes to you broken as you come to them broken to become more whole. But let me give it to you in the most practical terms what sanctification is. Your responsibility, your opportunity is to help your spouse to become like Jesus. Father asked me this last week, his son is getting married, and he said, what one piece of advice would you give to my, should I give to my son? And I thought about it, and I said, the one piece of advice I would give your son is this one. Marriage is more about your holiness than your happiness. Let me say that again. Kind of a quiet spell over the room on that one. That is, most people get married to be happy. But that's not, the, in my opinion, the biblical view of marriage. The bi biblical view of marriage is that we ought to get married to become holy. God uses our marriages to make us holy, to make us sanctified. The very institution of marriage you're in is equal in transforming you as the Bible that you have on your lap. I know men in this church who haven't changed in the nine years that I've been here, even though they come every week with their Bibles because they have not allowed their marriage to be the means by which God is transforming them. It's Bible in one hand, marriage in the other, and neither do the two meet. And so one of the keys in this whole concept is this word sanctification. So let's look at it. Ephesians 5, 25 through 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might, there it is, sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water and the word. Men are to sanctify, to set apart, to help their spouses become like Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14. It says this, For the unbelieving husband is made holy, sanctified, same Greek word, because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. That is, in the scriptures, God sees you and I coming together in a relationship, whether we're married to an unbeliever or a believer, to be a transforming agent in helping them to experience God in ways that they never have. Now, here's the question. How? How am I to sanctify my wife, Karen, and how is my wife, Karen, to sanctify me? Let me tell you how it won't happen. It won't happen if your marriage and your home is exactly like your non-Christian neighbor's home. Have you ever noticed that? I mean, if your relationship, the way you go about your home, get up, you run to work, you come home tired, you eat, you watch some TV, you go to bed, you get up, you go to work, and, and, and your lifestyle is exactly the same culture of your neighbor, it will not be a transforming agent in your, in your relationship with your spouse. Trust me. There have been too many days, weeks, years in my relationship with Karen where my home looked exactly like my non-Christian neighbor's home in the fact of how I went about my life and there was nothing measurably different in the two relationships. And so God comes along and says, I want this home to be a sanctifying sort of environment. And the question is, then how do I do that? Well... 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, we don't have a slide. Here's what it says. Likewise, likewise, wives, be subject to your husband, so that even if some do not obey the word, non-believer, disobedient, listen to what his counsel is, that they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. 
It, it's Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount that your life and my life in this world and in this marriage ought to be salt and light. And salt and light are both silent. So what God doesn't need you to do is go preach or go lay notes on their pillow or, or critique them or judge them. What God needs from you and I is to live a life that is silent but as powerful as light and as powerful as salt that makes them thirsty, that your response in your marriage entices them, that you leak the truth, not tell the truth. That's what he wants you to do. He wants you to experience something in your, in your own life, in your own living relationship with God that leaks out the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. Many behaviors, many gracious and good behaviors, kindness in the whole process. So our response is that not in my words, but in my silence, but not just in my silence, in my conduct, that the way I treat Karen every day is the way that Christ treats the church. And that in this sanctifying relationship, I die to the selfishness of me that grows in higher expectations for her than I have for me. And I become angry that she's not meeting my expectations. And I die to that selfishness so that I can be Jesus and being Jesus entice her to want to know the Jesus that's changing my life. That, that's where he's taking us here. That's what he wants for us. So within the marriage of sanctification, here's the big truth. Your responsibility is to be a part of that sanctifying process in your spouse. You should wake up every day and say, how can I draw my spouse into a deeper living relationship with Jesus based on the way that I live, speak, treat, love, respond? That, that's, that's the big truth here. You are to be a living example of a living Lord. But there's the second dynamic to this sanctifying relationship. Here's the big one. Not only are you to help sanctify your wife, but God has given your wife to sanctify you or your husband to sanctify you. That the very guy that's bugging you the very guy that you're irritated at, the very guy that leaves his underwear on the floor, the very guy that puts dishes in the sink, that guy has been brought into your life to help you, here it is, identify those parts of your life that need to be transformed. So now in my my relationship with Karen, those things that irritate me, my first response in a sanctifying relationship is not to say what's wrong with Karen. My first response is what's wrong with me? What is this telling me about me? And when you begin to explore and become self-aware of those parts of you that you have yet to see, and you allow the relationship to reveal that God can reveal not only in his scriptures, but in your relationship, what you need to work. Man, I got angry quick. What was that anger all about? You know, most of the problems that you are experiencing in your marriage have nothing to do with your spouse. They have everything to do with your childhood. How you were brought up, the culture that you lived in, the decisions that you made about yourself. Most issues in marriage are childhood issues. And now my spouse becomes a mirror for me to discover what it is in me that God wants to change. I can brush off a sermon. Half of you will forget it before you get to the car. But every day you're given an opportunity where by, God, by, by God's grace, he points out something to you and says, here's where I want you to work on. Where's the grace here? Where's the kindness here? Where's the love here? Where's the gentleness here? What's going on in your life, Bill, that would make you respond? Because she didn't make you respond that way. You chose to respond that way. And it's a great opportunity. Truth number two. Marriage, even though 
it may not get better. This is not the truth. This is a preliminary to the truth. You can get better. Marriage, even though it may not change, you can change. Marriage, even though it is, even though your marriage may not change because they are not willing to change, it can change because you can change. Those are big truths. Second point I want to establish with you is marriage, number two, is about submission to one another. These just get harder and harder, my friends. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 18 and 21 say this, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You are responsible to submit yourself to each other. Because the next verse is going to say, wives, submit to your husbands. And I know there are some sub husbands here that throw that verse out quick. Submit. It's right here. Verse 22. And they miss verse 21. And they miss verse 18. Because there's a progression here. I want you to see it. The progression is that you and I in our marriage are to be people filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, having been filled by the Holy Spirit, verse 21, submit to one another. And out of that filling of the Holy Spirit and out of that submitting to one another now becomes the responsibilities of a man and a wife. But it's in relationship to having been filled by the Holy Spirit and submitting to one another. Don't forget the progression. Paul has something in mind there. So what does submission mean? It means to give up one's rights to meet another's needs. It means to assume responsibility. It means to carry the burden. But it means this. In simple terms, it means to benefit another. Paul is saying, in your marriage, I want what guides you in your decision making is this question. Is what I'm doing benefiting my spouse. It will guide you. It will lead you. But let me take you to another verse, Philippians 2.3. Philippians 2.3 says this, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind count others more significant than yourself. Same Bible that teaches the resurrection is the same Bible that says, do not do, do nothing from selfish ambi ambition or conceit, but in humility of mind, count others more significant than yourself, or in this case, count your spouse more significant than you. I mean, there, there, there's, oh boy, there's just so much truth in all of this that Paul and Jesus and Peter had this common theme that in a marriage we are to serve one another. Society says marriage is about me getting. Christian marriage is about me giving. And our responsibility is to look at the other person and serve them in a way that Christ serves, I am to see them as more significant than me, and hopefully they will see me more significant than them, and therefore something magical happens in the journey. But this submitting goes beyond just submitting. It has to do with this sense of, in John 13, 
When, when Jesus came into a room full of guys with dirty feet and any guy should have been the one willing to clean the feet of the others and no one cleans the feet of the others and therefore the opportunity goes undone. No one wants to take responsibility. Jesus, the same Jesus that you celebrate on the cross hours before, gets on his needs and washes their feet. It wasn't his job. What is he doing? He did it as an example that if he can wash the disciples' feet, men, you ought to wash your wives' feet. Wives, you ought to wash your husbands' feet. It is that sort of submission to one another that marriage is all about. And if you miss that, you miss it all. There's always, there's always one more thing you can do to make your marriage better. You just got to discover what that is. Truth number three, not only is marriage about our sanctifying one another, not only is marriage about us submitting to one another, number three, marriage is about our satisfying one another. We are to satisfy one another. Let me give you the verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 3. The marriage bed must be a place of mutuality the husband seeking to satisfy, there's the word, satisfy his wife and the wife seeking to satisfy her husband. If you want another word, intimacy. If you want another word, sex. Marriage is designed for intimacy. It, it's designed to meet each other's needs. It, it's it's um, a place to please the other person. 15 to 20 percent of marriages are sexless. There are marriages in this room where people married have chosen out of anger or unforgiveness or habitual behavior not to participate in the satisfaction of their spouse. And let me tell you, from my perspective, according to 1 Corinthians, Paul, that a sexless marriage where one or the other person is in need is not a Christian marriage. I don't care how many Bible studies you go to. Now let me say this. There's a lot of ways to have sex. There's a lot of ways to experience intimacy. They're not all the same and there are different reasons we have for different things, but let me suggest to you that when God created Adam and Eve, he was pleased that they were both naked and unashamed. Do you know that 95% of marriages, when two people get married, are not soulmates even though they may think they are? We don't end up marrying our soulmate. But we do have the opportunity to become soulmates. The friends that I have, I, I have some good looking friends, older guys in their 60s, been married for 40 years. I know them well. They have not had affairs. And when I discover why they haven't had affairs and I've talked to them and drilled down why they haven't. And in ministry, there are a thousand opportunities to have them and they haven't. I discover the common theme of all of them is they're married to someone who has become their soulmate. That, that somewhere in the conversation, in the conversations, they've grown an intimacy that they never imagined. 
Paul Newman said when asked why didn't he have affairs on all the movie sets when he was away from his wife, said this, why eat hamburger when you got steak at home? When a couple finds a level of satisfaction and intimacy in their talking, in their conversation, there's something that happens there that creates something that you would never exchange. When you find yourself totally open, totally known, and responded to in grace and acceptance and given love, where you stop hiding, you're no longer behind the fig leaf. When you find that intimacy, that closeness, that love, there isn't any one night stance that's worth jeopardizing that. So here's the truth. Karen and I have been married 45 years. I don't know how she would answer this. I'm not going to ask her. <laughs> I think it's only been the last two years that we've become soulmates. I think it started with us deciding to have a cup of coffee every morning and talk. I think somewhere along the line we chose that we were going to trust the other person and reveal those parts of us that were scary, say those things, tell our wants, reveal our needs, work on our brokenness together, laugh at where we fail each other, Something happens when you're in a relationship that's safe, where, where, you, where you know each other. Because here's the truth. Here it is. You cannot know how to satisfy the other person if you haven't talked to the other person. If you don't know them, you can't satisfy them. In the dining room or in the bedroom that there's this sense of conversation that has to happen. And let me tell you that most of the conversations I have with people that come to me for counseling here at the church have to do with the simplicity of conversations. So how do I satisfy? How do we satisfy each other? We talk and learn. We become... Um, People who Paul says and Peter says, we become students of our wives or our spouses. But there's a second way to do it. And the second way is touch. Not only talking, which forgive me, men are from Mars, we, women are from Venus. They're, we do live on different planets. I don't care what anybody says. We are distinct and unique based on a whole lot of other things. But in generality, women love to process in conversation. Men tend to isolate their needs and go to the cave in conversations. Men have a higher need for touch, different kinds of touch than women. And in this response, Sometimes men don't extend a touch. Man took his wife to a counselor. They had been struggling for a long, long, long time. And the counselor sat and listened to the two of them. And at the end of the hour discovered that what his wife needed more than anything else was affection. The counselor gets up walks over to the wife, kisses her on the cheek, goes back and sits down and says to man, that's what your wife needs, right there. The man looks at the counselor somewhat confused, bewildered by it all, and then he says this, oh, that's gonna be hard because I work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, but I could come on Monday and Wednesday and Friday. He missed it. And we're that dumb, guys. So let me tell you how I punish my wife. Uh, so bad. Forgive me, my sweetheart. When I'm not getting the touching I want, I make sure I don't hold her hand and put my arm around her waist.
and hug her. That's how I get even. And it ought not to be that way. There, there is something intimate that we are to participate in in this process. So here's the rule under communication. Seek to understand more than to be understood. Most of you just want to be understood. You don't want to understand, and therefore you never have this kind of community and communication you need. Number four. Marriage is about our sanctifying one another. Marriage is about our submitting to one another. Marriage is about our satisfying with one another. And marriage is about our Savior being revealed to one another. Ephesians 6, 7 and 8, 7 says this. Listen to this. Rendering service with a good will as to the Lord. I could explain that for a long time and you never get out of here. It's simply this. You are to respond to your spouse as if you are doing it onto Jesus. Every act, every rendering, is a rendering unto Jesus in the name of Jesus for your spouse. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. So whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So let me try to do this for you. If marriage is this, two people, and how do those two people truly become one person, one flesh. Genesis 2, cleave to one another, glued to one another. I will suggest to you the process is if you're a husband or a wife and you say you love Jesus and you're following him, the more you become like Jesus and the more your spouse becomes like Jesus, the closer the two of you get. You become a triangle. You grow closer in your, you don't grow further apart, you grow closer together because not only are you knowing more about Jesus, you're becoming more like Jesus. That, that becomes the, the, the key here, that, that when Jesus becomes our focus, when this marriage is about glorifying him, when this marriage is about me helping my wife Karen and Karen helping her husband become more like Jesus than Jesus has become glorified in this marriage. And he smiles on it. But there's something more also in marriage that we tend to miss. Most people enter marriage in a consumer mentality. I come, I marry you, and I expect certain things in return. It's reciprocal. And the moment in this relationship of consumerism, I'm not getting what I want, then I go to the next store. You go to Target and you don't like their prices, you go to Walmart, big deal. You go to Dutch Brothers for a cup of coffee and you stop loving it and you go to Starbucks because it's a consumer rela re relationship. It's a mutual, I better get what I give or at least more than I give. And if I don't, I have no obligation. And we come into Christian marriages with a consumer mentality because that's what the culture is. But that's not a Christian marriage. A Christian marriage doesn't come into a marriage out of consumerism. It comes to a marriage out of covenantness. We join each other in a covenant. We give each other an oath. We swear by heaven and earth for better or worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. That vow, if you gave it, was a vow not only to your spouse, it was a vow to God. And you have to, to the best of your ability, honor that vow and there are reasons for divorce. But it's always the last resort. It's never the first resort. Because God wants to do a work in you that only he can do. 
So let me try to wrap this up in a story. Because here's what I think this story is going to tell you. Your marriage, if you practice these four truths, will experience more love. A love that some of you have given up on. O. Henry writes a story called The Gift of the Magi in which a couple at the turn of the century, the 1900, Jim and Della, are fastly approaching Christmas and they're a poor, 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 poor couple. They don't have much. And both are doing everything they can to put some money away so they can give a gift on Christmas morning that is special, that is a reflection of their love for each other. But no matter how hard he works, he can't save a penny. And no matter what she does, she can't save enough. And they find themselves approaching Christmas and they want so much to express their love. And, and, and Jim loves Della's long hair and Della's hair is a, a, a symbol of pride and beauty and she loves her hair and and Jim has a, a watch that's been handed down from family to family generation to generation and he treasures that watch and they both know that but now Christmas is coming and Della wants to do something special and she wants so much to get Jim a chain for that watch so when it's in his pocket he can pull it out and hold but she has no money on Christmas Eve, she goes to a shop that buys hair and takes her elegant hair and sells it so that there's nothing left on her head but a thin layer of hair. She's given up her beauty and her pride to be able to get her husband a chain for his watch on Christmas because that's all she's got. Christmas Eve comes, she comes into the door, she looks at her husband, her husband sees that she has not her long, elegant hair, and she gives him a gift, and in the box is a chain for his watch, and he realizes she's exchanged her beauty for his gift. He then hands her his gift, and in his box is several elegant hair combs of jewelry on it. Because he's exchanged his watch for her hair. I hope that you can begin to take these principles and find the love that would give up what you treasure most for your spouse and it would be no sacrifice. I hope you find that love by discovering that the most important thing in this marriage is your spouse becoming like Jesus. And the most important thing you can do is serve them. And the most important thing you can do is satisfy them. And the most important thing that you can do is elevate Jesus with them. It will change. And if it doesn't change, it will change you for the better. Here's my prayer <clears throat> on the way here and all day yesterday and this week that you would not hear my words that somewhere in all these words you would hear the voice of God speak to you so that he could bring about in your marriage what he truly wants. Because hear me say this, God created marriage. It is his institution. And somewhere in the heart of God, he wants more than anything else for two people to be in love in a way that he designed it to be.